Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar Stress-Free and Cost-Effective Concepts for Prophylaxis and Periodontology. It is a great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Karsten Stockleben, who will discuss which workflows are suitable in prophylaxis and periodontology when both therapeutic success and economic aspects are considered. We would like to thank Dr. Stockleben for being with us today and thank DT Study Club for making this lecture possible. Please take note of any questions and comments you have during the lecture, as they will be addressed by Dr. Stockleben at the end of the presentation. Without any further delay, please help me welcome the expert himself, Dr. Karsten Stockleben. Okay, welcome everybody out there in the internet. Uh, it's a pleasure to share some time with you. And uh, I hope you are sitting comfortably in your lounge chair, having a cool drink in your hand. And uh, now we're going to share approximately an hour of uh, one of our favorite topics. It's uh, prophylaxis and periodontology. And I want to give you some impulses and ideas uh, how to think sometimes critically about what we do and how to improve things. OK, then let's get started. OK, this machine doesn't work well. By the way, what you see here is uh, our office in, in Hanover, Germany, uh, which I share with my brother. And our well, emphasis is, uh, of course, as you can tell, periodontology and prophylaxis, but also comprehensive uh, dentistry and reconstructions. Uh, OK, our program for today is uh, the problem periodontitis uh, that's uh, highly neglected in dentistry, not only in, in Germany, uh, but uh, globally. Uh, we've got to talk about diagnostics and uh, 3D diagnostics can be an interesting uh, point in uh, periodontal uh, treatment uh, uh, planning. We're going to talk about concepts and uh, delegation. Uh, because it's very hard to do uh, things just on our own. Uh, and of course, we've got to talk about efficiency. Uh, what can we do to be uh, faster, better, more economical uh, in prophylaxis and uh, in periotherapy? And then we've got to talk a little bit about uh, money, of course, because nothing on earth is free. There are no free meal tickets. Uh, and this is something we tend to forget in dentistry. Uh, so let's talk about the problem perio. Okay, uh, you might know uh, this chart. Uh, it's the pathogenesis of uh, periodontitis uh, based on uh, the research of Page and Corman from uh, 97. And um, the basic problem is that we've got uh, on the left hand side the dental biofilm. Uh, which is uh, part of this huge uh, human uh, microbiome. Most uh, bugs uh, are our friends, uh, but some of them are, are really nasty. They are pathogenic and uh, they want to virtually kill uh, its host. So uh, if we look at uh, the biofilm in conjunction with the, the mucosa and the gingiva, especially uh, in the proximal region, uh, we're going to see inflammation if we don't get rid of uh, this biofilm. The biofilm develops. Uh, it's uh, getting mature, uh, which means that after eight to 10 weeks of maturation, uh, the mean bugs and pathogens uh, will take command. And uh, what happens? Uh, in the end, uh, there's a war going on between the biofilm, which uh, attacks with antigens and virulence factors, and the immune system reacts, defends by sending antibodies and uh, neutrophils. And uh, we see the inflammation in dentistry, which is quite easy because we've got a nicely accessible um, field of view. Uh, some other medical specialities uh, have got a much harder time uh, assessing uh, their points of interest. So uh, the inflammation shows typically by bleeding and swelling. Uh, unfortunately, there's hardly any pain which would be 
helpful in uh, getting the patient involved and uh, getting its compliance. Okay. The inflammation produces cytokines and metalloproteinases. Uh, they're going to distract uh, the soft and hard tissue, basically. And this is both arranged and uh, yeah, shows variation by risk factors. One is uh, genetics, which can easily check uh, with the family history. And the other ones are easy to check as well, because it's first it's smoking, second is uh, bone pathology, uh, stress, which will reduce, uh, reduce uh, the immune uh, system, uh, obesity, obesity uh, so uh, being overweight is a big risk factor in uh, developing uh, periodontitis, and uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, because uh, that disease and periodontitis uh, show very similar patterns uh, in uh, their um, way of, of uh, building up and uh, starting and how they both work together nicely. Okay, in the end, we've got a change in the connective tissue and in the bone metabolism. The bone will uh, retreat, the pocket will build up, get deeper, and this is a great hideaway in the end for uh, the dental biofilm, which develops nicely there and will reinfect other regions of the oral cavity. So, in the end it goes back then to the left hand side, to the biofilm, to the microflora, because uh, the biofilm will have better hideaways and better places to develop. And until about uh, 20 years ago, we just saw this as an isolated problem. But uh, 20 years ago, uh, dentistry slowly uh, discovered that uh, there's more in periodontal disease and destruction than losing teeth. But uh, in Germany, every couple of years, uh, there are big studies going on. Uh, thousands of participants um, and uh, our problem is that uh, we see an increase in periodontal uh, disease in our population and this with age and uh, even though this uh, chart is in German I want to show you one thing uh, with age periodontal destruction is getting worse which is very easy to understand because it's time plus bacteria uh, and uh, what we see, starting between 40 and 50 years of age in our patients, is uh, recession. And there's one crucial point in understanding periodontal disease. We've got the C junction uh, as the major measuring point for uh, looking at uh, attachment loss. And often our employees they just look at pocket depth, which is from the margin of the soft tissue to the bottom of the pocket, which is totally different to attachment loss, which is C junction to the bottom of the pocket. So this includes recession plus um, the uh, pocket depth. And this number is interesting for looking at periodontal disease and the severity and the prognosis, of course. And uh, this chart uh, shows that if you're between 35 and 44 years old, uh, in our German population, we've got about 62% of our population with severe periodontal disease, which is defined attachment, loss, five millimeters or more. Most of these people uh, have localized periodontal destruction in uh, their pockets. So it's not circumferential uh, when we look at destruction. Uh, so it's about 49% of them have uh, just uh, isolated destruction in the pocket. Uh, and only 13% have generalized uh, the problem.
if you're getting older, 20 years later, between 65 and uh, 74, it's about 90% of the population suffering from severe periodontal uh, title, uh, periodontitis. Uh, whereas more than 50% have generalized pocketing around their teeth. So you can see the destruction takes time. But something that's hard to understand for me is when I've got a new patient and uh, I talk to them, they all say, well, I'm cleaning my teeth twice a day and I'm visiting my dentist regularly. So this basically cannot be the problem and the explanation. Uh, my doubt is that uh, we as dentists tend to look at carriers and cariogenic destruction because this is where money for reconstruction comes from and uh, this is an old historic uh, problem for us in dentistry uh, and the emphasis in education at university and also at reimbursement uh, is mainly on uh, destruction not on periodontal disease. So, but looking at numbers and to, to understand the problem with periodontal disease is uh, the demographic change. If we look at a chart from 2012 uh, and the more reddish colors uh, show that uh, there is uh, an age a group of uh, people in a society, in a country, 60 years or older, and that group uh, counts for 30% or more. So now, nowadays, you look at Japan, Scandinavia, Germany, Italy, Greece. Uh, so we've got quite an old uh, general population. But what's going to happen in the rest of the world in the next years? Well, looking at 2050, you see red mostly all over the place. The only place where we're going to see a majority of young people in a society will be Africa. So all Western or civilized uh, countries will have a demographic uh, problem, more or less uh, severe. But uh, if you look at the numbers I've shown you before, that with age, we're going to sh see more periodontal disease, not because it's connected to getting older, but it's a problem of neglect, of neglecting, taking care of patients and managing the biofilm. So here you can see where the problem and also the future business uh, will be. And if you look at the age pyramid uh, that you usually used to have in a society, uh, you can see that uh, about 100 years ago, it was a kind of arrow, arrow or a pyramid. And then 90 years later, at the turn of uh, the century, uh, you could see, especially here in Germany, that uh, due to, to world wars and uh, loss of population, uh, due to that uh, sad fact, um, you can see uh, quite a change in shape. But interestingly, if you look at the bottom, the base is getting much smaller, so birth rate is uh, decreased. And if you look at a prognosis for 2050, well, it will be very difficult uh, to find employees because the base is getting smaller again, whereas the end, uh, at the end of the lifetime, life circle, uh, you see a huge group of old people. Uh, and this is a challenge uh, unknown uh, to our societies yet. Uh, that will be an interesting uh, thing to see how we will be able to cope uh, with that uh, problem. But it will show that there's a major group in our society need for treatment for periodontal disease. It's not about keeping that dentition. This is not the major uh, point for me. Uh, of course, as a dentist, I want to keep the dentition of my patients. But more importantly, is the fact to keep people healthy. So, reality today is, in Germany, with a population of about 82 million people, we've got 23 million people with moderate or severe cases uh, of periodontal infection, disease, in the age group between 35 and 74 years old. Interestingly enough, 
we just had 800,000 new perio cases uh, which are being paid uh, by the national insurance company. Easy, uh, simple treatment, but better than nothing. But it doesn't match the numbers. This is what I want to show. So the problem is uh, that started 20 years ago was uh, the systemic link. And uh, 20 years ago, uh, scientists uh, figured out that uh, there seems to be a link between atherosclerosis and periodontal disease. Result is stroke and uh, coronary heart disease uh, resulting in an earlier death, reduction of uh, years in life and quality of life. In the meantime, we've got a long list like uh, low birth weight, premature birth, uh, chronic uh, respiratory diseases, easy to understand because we're going to swallow and inhale uh, periodontal pathogens. Uh, diabetes mellitus is a major problem with obesity increasing enormously in Western society, especially in the US, but also in Western Europe. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a big decrease, uh, increase in numbers of uh, in, uh, affected or in, in, in of, uh, diabetic uh, people. General morbidity is increasing. I said we're going to lose uh, years in our lives. Uh, bone disease, osteoporosis uh, is a connection. Later findings in the last years are rheumatoid uh, arthritis, erectile dysfunction, interesting for one percentage of uh, male uh, people. And uh, if you look at uh, old people, it's cognitive decline, strongly connected to uh, periodontal disease. Uh, so this is quite a challenge, and uh, this is more important to take care about this than saving teeth. I think we all agree on that. So if we look uh, at the inflammation and uh, the, uh, the size of uh, the infection, of the chronic infection, if we've got a severe periodontal patient, this is about the size of the infection. If we look at all the pocket uh, tissues uh, involved, the inflammation progresses over decades. It's hardly ever diagnosed, even though people attend dentists regularly. There is no cure. Once the bone is gone, uh, it's basically gone forever. Uh, but the good news is the infection, uh, infection can be controlled. We've got a huge number of bacteria. Um, about 50% of them are known. Uh, the rest we cannot detect, detect yet because it's quite a challenge in the human uh, microbiome project uh, to uh, show evidence of uh, the others. They are very difficult uh, to show. And we're still not sure about uh, the role of uh, viruses and fungi in the biofilm. So it's quite uh, interesting uh, to see the next years. But for many years, if you look at this uh, study from 87, we know what to do in dentistry. Uh, so we're able to detect periodontal disease and we're able to treat uh, periodontal uh, disease and also to prevent periodontal disease. So all three things are quite old. The problem is we don't do it. Uh, and Axelson uh, showed in Sweden quite clearly uh, that over a span of 15 years uh, where he uh, had his patients in a strict uh, maintenance protocol uh, that uh, those who attended the program they didn't lose any attachment. They even gained 0.2 millimeters over 15 years. But those who were in the control and didn't take part and didn't show compliance, they lost about 1.4 millimeters. That's about 0.1 millimeter per year in uh, attachment. So this is a clear sign of uh, the influence of bacteria and inflammation in conjunction with the bone and uh, soft tissue. And also, 
since uh, Exelon is, is very engaged in uh, this topic uh, and he showed us a lot in the past, uh, some, some basic understanding of uh, the problem, he had a look at uh, his uh, population or at his study group uh, 30 years later. Uh, and uh, he could show that the incidence of caries and periodontal disease as well as tooth mortality in the subject sample in this group was very small. So we know for many years how to do things. We just have to do it. So talking about diagnostics, which is the first step of uh, getting involved. Well, we've got to diagnose periodontal disease, which is easy. What do we need? Basically, just a periodontal probe and an open eye and an open mind. We just have to know where to look at. And with that knowledge and some data, we're able to manage, so to fine tune uh, the system, prophylaxis and also periodontal disease and, and periodontal therapy, because both um, things belong together. You cannot perform good periodontal treatment if you don't have a really good prophylaxis system. So both takes effort uh, and, and uh, having a good prophylaxis system is hard work and it's not hard work only starting it and getting it defined and integrated into your office but also keeping it running. It needs constant input, motivation for your team, for yourself and of course for your patients. And you need concepts, so how to do things with each group uh, that you're dealing with. So if we're talking about diagnostics, what are the points of interest? Bleeding and probing, very important. Attachment loss, very important to know whether you've got a light, moderate, or severe case. Pocket depth, yes, but not as important as attachment loss. Mobility, Yes, important to look at the prognosis. But interestingly, the prognosis can be changed depending on the compliance of the patient and the quality of your program. You need x-rays to have a look at the bone and you've got to check compliance. Uh, compliance is crucial. If a patient doesn't cooperate, you cannot win. You can do anything. Uh, it's just a waste of time, money and effort. Uh, so basically, you've got one third of the population. They are quite easy uh, to access and uh, they're going to show quite good compliance. Second third is hard work, but you can be successful. Third, third or last third, which is the lower end usually of society, um, very difficult. And uh, what kind of... Um, Toys do we have and do we use? Uh, of course, you can use the periodontal probe uh, to feel what's in the pocket and uh, you can do things better. Uh, since this uh, seminar is uh, sponsored by Cavo, of course, I would like to share some products uh, with you. And this is one uh, toy we're using for years, uh, which is the Di Diagnet Dent uh, Paro. Uh, there's a crystal tip, which is very fragile, unfortunately, but with that tip, you just go into the pocket and with laser fluorescency, uh, you can measure and get a signal whether you've removed all the debris or not. So it's easy to uh, evaluate the quality of your work. And especially if you've got deeper pockets where it's quite difficult if uh, you don't open it up surgically uh, to, to remove all uh, the calculus. And then you can check and re-enter. Very smart. And it's pain-free. It's uh, very nice to show motivationally for the patient. And then uh, basically diagnostics. We've got three things. We've got the clinical diagnostics. The probe and the eye, very important. Seconds with x-ray. And then we've got the CBCT in the last years, which is quite a gain. And when we started many years ago with the CBCT, 
uh, we thought, well, is it a good idea to uh, get into this technology, not only for implant planning and surgical procedures, which I do a lot and I love it, but uh, does it help in evaluation processes and uh, getting an idea of the prognosis of single T's or groups of T's uh, in periodontal, uh, periodontally um, affected uh, patients? And it really does help. Uh, the CBCT is something I don't want to miss. And of course, we've got a cable CBCT in our office. Uh, and uh, it shows me quite nicely uh, the bony destruction, the frications. Uh, I can plan my surgical access uh, if I go into uh, periodontal surgery and augmentation procedures. And it shows me very nicely the prognosis, uh, which is helpful then in treatment planning when we go into um, let's say, more sophisticated uh, prosthodontics. And if you look at this case, for example, uh, no mobility in these teeth, very good compliance uh, in this patient, uh, and we've got a major loss of bone, but still can see things are stable. I didn't have to do any surgical procedures, uh, and these teeth lasted for close to 20 years. Uh, until the patient finally passed away. And this is a case uh, that I planned for surgery and uh, where I performed uh, augmentative uh, surgery. Uh, and uh, you can see the small amount of bone, uh, which uh, looks like uh, there are, it's, it's basically missing, but there was a very thin layer of bone because it's just as a result of the thickness of uh, the voxel. Uh, in the image, uh, and we could uh, perform surgically here uh, very well, and uh, these uh, things are uh, teeth are stable for years. Uh, the basic problem with two dimensional x ray in diagnostics is that you place the film intraorally, uh, you get your x ray beam from the outside, and you project a three dimensional object into dimensions of the film level. And of course, uh, you cannot see everything clearly because it overlays. Uh, so you miss some sometimes crucial information. Uh, like in this case, uh, where it was quite uh, easy to see that uh, the second molar on the right hand side, uh, which we call 1 7, was uh, periodontally uh, affected heavily and uh, had no prognosis. Uh, so we planned for an implant. But uh, when I uh, took my CBCT, the rest looks fairly well, and uh, the play patient, uh, and she's somebody from the States, uh, shows good compliance. And if we look at uh, 2.7, well, that, on the first glance, looks quite nice. But if we go into slices, you can see uh, that the trifurcation is wide open, and the prognosis is not very good for this tooth. Uh, so that was uh, quite a surprise because clinically uh, it didn't really show. Or, for example, if you look at a frication here where you've got a, a high bone margin, uh, you need uh, a curved uh, periodontal uh, frication uh, probe uh, to detect it. Or you use your uh, CBCT uh, to get a general, a general view of uh, the situation, destruction, and the prognosis. Or this case, for example, uh, which was a combined case and interesting to see uh, because uh, it was a periendo uh, problem. In the end, it turned out uh, when I uh, took the tooth out that uh, we had a fracture in the root. Uh, my brother is a specialist for endodontics and he performed endodontics here. But if you do good endodontics, uh, you sometimes see these uh, fracture lines and there's no cure. Uh, for it. Okay, let's talk about concepts and uh, delegation. Because uh, the increasing number of periodontal cases in our population, which is getting older, as I've mentioned, it's uh, quite uh, difficult to perform the periodontal maintenance, the recall, on your own as a dentist. It's just impossible. So you have to have uh, staff which is motivated, well educated. Uh, helping to keep patients uh, in good shape. 
In Germany, we've got a problem uh, with delegation because many of my colleagues uh, think, well, our employees are not allowed to get into the pocket and to uh, get rid of the biofilm. But this, which is something I'm going to show later on, is crucial for success. Uh, so I looked it up and uh, even here in Germany where things are quite regulated and quite strict, uh, if our employees are educated for it, and I can do this on my own, for example, this is sufficient, uh, they are allowed to do it. So I don't have to feel bad. I have to feel bad if my employees don't go into uh, the pockets because uh, then horizontal maintenance doesn't work. So uh, our employees are allowed to do this if they are qualified. Full we'll stop. Now, if you look at prophylaxis, um, and this is in, in German, but don't worry, uh, I just want to show one thing. If you look at prophylaxis, we think, well, it's just, you know, avoiding carriers, keeping teeth nice, shiny, uh, and white. And I know uh, this, especially from my American uh, colleagues, uh, that uh, their patients are big wimps. They want to look good, feel good, uh, don't feel anything when they're on the chair. So sometimes it's quite difficult uh, to get into their pockets, uh, just depending on how you approach them, technically. But um, there's more to prophylaxis than just having clean, super gingival conditions. Uh, so getting rid of staining and biofilm and so on. So it's carriers, of course. It's periodontal disease. Yes, yes, it's the challenge. It's the big thing in prophylaxis. But it's also looking at bruxism, looking at erosion, smelling, halitosis, and treating it. This is all part of uh, a prophylaxis program, which is comprehensive and is, uh, is the major uh, key in dental success. Dental success for me is defined by keeping the patient healthy for the rest of their life with their own dentition, uh, no removable, removable uh, dentures. So I want to have a high level of comfort and health, of course. And in the end, we should look at changes in, in the soft tissue uh, because uh, the mortality in uh, oral carcinomas uh, hasn't, hasn't, hasn't changed in the last uh, 30 to 40 years, which is a nightmare uh, if you look at other uh, specialities. Now we're entering the digital workflow, so we don't just write things on paper. We might uh, have stuff in the computer. Uh, diagnostics is getting more comprehensive and uh, more complex. And the challenging uh, need for um, yeah, documentation is increasing. Uh, on the one hand, uh, for getting better results, if we talk about quality, on the other hand, uh, if we uh, look at state regulations and uh, law, and then we've got this uh, challenge of uh, motivating patients because we uh, compete uh, with uh, travel, cars, leisure, fashion, and so on uh, in, uh, in, their, in the patient's attention and uh, in, uh, also in their, let's say, um, money flow. And then it's instruction. We've got to re-educate our patients. Okay, everybody is cleaning their teeth. But the question is how efficient do they do it? If it would be efficient and if dental treatment or maintenance would be successful, uh, people would be healthy if they attend their dentist and clean their teeth regularly. Obviously, this doesn't work, this concept. Uh, so the, one of the problems is in the dental office, the other one is in the patient. And of course, you need a lot of uh, equipment and toys uh, and so on. But you have to look at some basics because most of the things uh, you do uh, with the 
quite a limited number of instruments and things. Only for special needs, uh, you need special toys. So if we look at risk orientation and concepts in periodontal treatment, uh, it's quite easy. If you've got a live carrier case, which means attachment loss of one to two millimeters, which is not a lot actually, and we think, oh, patient is healthy, but we've got to use our instruments and our brain. And of course, we've got to know how to measure things. These patients usually uh, are integrated in a program at the beginning, when we see a new patient, and it's the live period case, three appointments in our period department. With a uh, break of uh, a week in between. And uh, we're going to do three things. Instruction, diagnostics, and thorough cleaning. Afterwards, now we've got set of data, risk assessment, uh, we've got much better clinical conditions, we're going to see the patient for conservative period treatment, which is close treatment, fairly easy to do. And then they're going to end up afterwards in a recall system, usually three months. Moderate period cases, attachment loss of three to four millimeters, they're going to have basically the same introduction program, they're going to see a conservative uh, periotherapy, which is full mouth treatment. We're going to do all four quadrants in one session because it's so easy nowadays uh, with these uh, gentle instruments to perform this without harming the patient and without harming soft or hard tissue. Uh, we're going to use clean pro powder. And uh, if it's case that's not so compliant, uh, we're going to introduce him to the post uh program where we see him uh, after the periodontal treatment for four times in a span of a month. So every week he's going to have one appointment where we thoroughly clean the pockets again to just decrease the biofilm load and uh, allowing for better healing. And then we're going to see him for re-evaluation after the fourth visit, where we're going to get a new and a complete set of, of data. Recall intervals will be 8 to 12 weeks, so 2 to 3 months, depending on how his system reacts, which is easy to see uh, with the data you get at every recall session. Severe caparial cases, well, they're more difficult. 5 millimeters, attachment loss, same program, but our employees need more time because the pockets are deeper and of course they need more time to clean them thoroughly. Because when I'm going to see the patient for periodontal therapy, uh, I don't want to see a lot of uh, debris anymore. So it's conservative, the treatment. Uh, it's uh, full mouth treatment again. We're going to use clean pro powder. We're going to use photoactive disinfection, which is very nice uh, and helpful. Sometimes antibiotics, but not a lot uh, because it's uh, the side effect is, is quite heavy and we've got to consider that. Usually most cases you can manage just uh, with conservative uh, means. These patients all enter the post program because we've got four weeks of uh, healing uh, for the soft tissue and uh, in this period of time we go want to have a uh, very little amount of biofilm. Recall intervals, four to eight weeks for quite a long time, depending on the data. Sometimes they go on to three months after years, but this really depends on the clinical situation and how uh, things develop. So the protocol is quite easy. We're going to see the patient. And this is the introduction uh, program. First visit, oral hygiene instruction, motivation, bleeding or probing, uh, getting all the data. And uh, of course, professional uh, tooth cleaning, uh, polishing, subgingival debridement. We usually use ultrasonic instruments. It's very delicate uh, and, and uh, 
nice slimline inserts um, and uh, we're going to install a chlorhexidin uh, and of course we need a lot of documentation the data a week later we're going to see the patient again for the second appointment the first one usually takes about 45 minutes to an hour the second one takes about 45 minutes uh, in a let's say regular adult uh, or a hygiene control remotivation uh, evaluation and uh, professional tooth cleaning. A week later, we're going to see him again. Again, our hygiene, control, remotivation, um, appraisal, if he's doing a good job, etc. Now I'm going to get a proper set of data bleeding or probing, pocket depth, recessions, mobility, etc. So this is a gold standard where we start from. Then it's the decision, do we need parallel treatment? And this is uh, a team decision uh, to go with our dental hygienists. And uh, then uh, when we go into periodontal treatment, okay, fine. And then we define what kind of treatment, how intense it will be. Uh, and then the difficult cases, we get into this intense, intense post-perio program for appointments with a week in between. Takes about half an hour. Professional tooth cleaning, subgingerly, uh, and on the first, fourth appointment, we're going to get a complete new set of data, re-evaluation, and then we're going to see the patient again and discuss further steps which might be necessary. This is the point where we discuss uh, surgical intervention for the first time, if it's necessary at that point. And we define uh, the recall intervals, depending on the data. Uh, we get. Once in a year, we're going to have a yearly checkup, x rays, big set of data uh, to know what's going on. And in between, I usually get bleeding uh, and probing, probing uh, at every appointment. And the patient should always leave the office with a new appointment. Uh, this is the most effective way of uh, doing recall. Okay, talking about recall, what's behind it? Usually patients come in, a uh, patient comes in with a diseased uh, situation. With the introduction program, we're going to help him and lift him up uh, into a more healthy state. And we can keep this healthy state with a recall because we always get a reinfection. Uh, the biofilm always comes back. Uh, we're going to keep the patient with a recall stable over years. That shouldn't be a problem. But we're going to show and see a recurrence if the patient doesn't keep his uh, appointments, if the intervals are too long, or if he stops attending uh, the recall program. Then he's going to end up where he started. So basic intervals, six months for carries-free kids and adolescents. But most, adolescent, uh, but most adults uh, have... Uh, periodontal tissue. So here we start with three months for normal patients and adults. Two months for high carous risk patients and moderate uh, periodontal patients and one to two months with severe peri patients. And then it's always an individual decision based on uh, the data assessment we get. Well, how long does the recall interval need? It depends on the quality of your employees. It depends on the number of teeth. It depends on the quality of the patient and his problems. So it can be 20 minutes for somebody who has got just a few teeth to 60 minutes. But usually patients, if you've got these shorter intervals, are in fairly good shape. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the American uh, Academy of Periodontology uh, gave some statements for recall. And uh, this is uh, just what we've discovered, three month intervals for patients who've got a Periodontal history is just fine, but it should be modified uh, if things deteriorate. And patients should also go back into active treatment. Uh, so having performed the periodontal therapy doesn't necessarily mean that this is the only one in their life. In some patients, we're going to do this regularly, once a year or every two years. Uh, just to keep uh, the patient on a good level. And this is very helpful since we can uh, intervene 
very gently uh, without uh, any collateral uh, damage. So why did I mention that it's so important that uh, we have to work sub gingerly? Well, many years ago in uh, Sweden by Ms. Westfell, there was a study, it's nearly 20 years old, and uh, Ms. Westfell uh, wanted to know what happens if I just do supra gingival cleaning, so this feel good wellness program uh, for patients when they come in and they've got their date or rendezvous tonight and they say, oh, I want a shiny teeth and a nice smile. Uh, so uh, clean my teeth. And uh, of course, the patient shouldn't feel any discomfort, so we don't approach the pockets, even though we know that about 80% of our population, when they're adults, will have problems. So, Ms. Westfeld did the following. The test group uh, was just cleaned super attentively, all patients with a periodontal history, and the control group, proper recall, which means working in the pocket as well, subgingerly, removing the biofilm. Okay, what happened? Well, the study was stopped by the Ethics Commission because uh, the patient in the test group suffered. Even though you attend a periodontal maintenance program or recall program, and you're just clean supragingerly, you're gonna lose, and that's about in 10% of the cases, you're gonna lose more than two millimeters of attachment in this period of time where the study was uh, going on. If had no change in 80% and a reduction of pocketing in 10% in the number of, in the region of two millimeters. Whereas in the control group, where there was sub gingival cleaning regularly, there was no loss of bone and about 40% of the patients gained attachment. So this is a big difference. So if we do recall in periodontal patients, we always have to go into the pocket. That's the message, it's as easy as that. And uh, what's nice and convenient uh, with gentle treatment is full-mouth treatment. Uh, in some studies, there's no scientific evidence, but it's common sense for me that we're gonna see improved clinical outcomes. If we clean the mouth all four quadrants at a time, First, it's more efficient. The patient, secondly, has just got to show up once, not four times. And um, reinfection is uh, the point, number three. Because uh, if you do quadrant by quadrant, with a week or two weeks in between, uh, the problem is reinfection because uh, the matured biofilm will uh, detach clusters of intact mature biofilm and they're gonna just fly around in the or a cavity like little spaceships and they're gonna reinfect all the regions that you've just cleaned so very fast you're gonna have a mature biofilm in your pockets again so the time window for healing and reconstruction of the tissue is much smaller so this is the basic thought about full mouth treatment. So it's always a question of the quality and quantity of biofilms, uh, whether the patient will stay healthy or not. It's just a principle of life uh, that's uh, underlying here. So this chart, which uh, came to my mind uh, some time ago, uh, is the basic sense of prophylaxis. So what's going on? Usually the patient comes in in a diseased condition. Okay, we've got a lot of biofilm, so quality, so quantity is high. And the quality is this big red part in the upper uh, chart. Uh, you've got a huge number of, pathogen, of pathogens uh, in here. So if you do prophylaxis, you go into a state of health, to the green. So you've got a majority of apathogenic uh, microbes and just a small number of 
pathogenic microbes. And the quantity, the number itself is slow. So this is the place where you're healthy and you're going to stay healthy. Unfortunately, there is this yeah, uh, hunger for life in, in every uh, species uh, and uh, bacteria will uh, double every 20 minutes, basically. So what's going to happen in all the hidden places? They're going to explode. So this is why we intervene after approximately three months, because uh, the dynamic of the biofilm, life, uh, will just come to the point that we have got a, an increase in number, in quantity, and of course, a change in quality. So the pathogens will take over again. So this is the, the game uh, we play in, uh, in prophylaxis. It's always cleaning up biofilm management, reinfection, and vice versa. And we're going to do this all lifelong. So the challenge is to do this in a gentle way and to avoid collateral uh, damage. Uh, things can be quite easy today. Uh, I stopped basically using curettes uh, more than 20 years ago because I uh, could see that uh, with sonic or ultrasonic instruments, uh, you're much more efficient at the learning curve, which is, is uh, faster, especially for your employees. Uh, and uh, things should be easy and reliable. Uh, so if you look at the Soniflex uh, air scaler from Cabo uh, that can be attached to any uh, tubing of uh, your unit, it's very easy to use. Uh, you've got a short learning curve and it adapts uh, to the multiflex uh, coupling, uh, so to any tubing you've got, whatever uh, unit you're using. And then another nice uh, thing is uh, the Profiflex from uh, Cavo. It's an airflow handy, it's mobile, so you can use it in different uh, operatories. Uh, it uses sodium bicarbonate uh, for super gingerbread cleaning and glycin, it's a salt, uh, for sub gingerbread cleaning. And especially glycin is highly interesting uh, because uh, it will uh, clean uh, the pocket up to five millimeters easily and 99% uh, of the bacteria of the biofilm will disappear very easily. And it again adapts to the multiflex coupling, it's reliable uh, technically because if things are complex and don't work you don't use them. So they've got to be reliable every day. And it's quick and gentle. So now the tendency goes to sub the cleaning with glycin. Uh, and uh, so Cavo developed this uh, Profiflex uh, Paro. You've got to change uh, one of uh, those uh, little screws in, in, inside of uh, the tank. And uh, you've got two inserts. Uh, both are very valuable uh, for using uh, the stuff uh, sub -gingerly. And of course, not to be mixed up, uh, in the daily routine, you've got an extra uh, container for the glycin with the writing perio on top, which is, you can see on the left hand side, um, not to be mixed up because you should never use uh, sodium uh, bicarbonate uh, subgingerly. It destroys soft tissue, it destroys uh, the cementum and uh, the dentin. It's very painful and uh, you won't like it and the patient will dislike you a lot if you do this. Uh, so reading the manual is helpful and getting some training. Um, so back to the Profif, uh, to the Profiflex uh, Perio, you can either use uh, a little uh, nozzle to go into the pocket and with a sweeping uh, motion go into it and around uh, the uh, pocket to uh, install the glycine and to clean uh, the pocket, but also very efficient uh, to up to five millimeters is just using the regular nozzle uh, and going with a 45 degree angulation into the pocket with the glycine. Very helpful and to just go around the root surface. It takes about five seconds for every side. Highly efficient. Okay, then if we quickly come back to carriers, uh, the eye is not very helpful. X-rays are more helpful, uh, especially bite wings uh, in carrier detection. But um, 
there are modern means nowadays like the Diagnocam for carriers diagnostics. Uh, it's a, we call D40, it's a fiber optic trans elimination, a double uh, way. You're gonna see instant results, clear pictures with a high predictability of uh, carriers. And it's also very motivational for the patient to see uh, these pictures. Okay, then talking about uh, money and economics. Uh, many years ago, when I was a student in England, uh, I was told, well, you don't, but you get what you pay for. And this is basically true uh, in life. And if you don't pay for proper, proper prophylaxis and proper, proper perio treatment, you won't get quality. It's just impossible because the effort for a good periodontal maintenance program is so high, and I know what I'm talking about, um, it's just costly. But on the other hand, the benefits are great. So it's a win-win situation. And uh, basic thoughts on economics is uh, something we didn't learn in dental school, unfortunately. We didn't learn anything about calculation and, and cost estimates and uh, the value of time and uh, so on. So you need a specific individual calculation for your office. You have got to know how much is an hour of my time, how much costs an hour of my employee in the payroll department or in the recall. So we've got to define a realistic fee per hour and break this down to usually five minutes, like in the car industry. And this is how you've got to schedule the patients because some patients need 20 minutes, other patients need 60 minutes. So of course they shouldn't pay the same amount uh, of money, which is unfair in my eyes. So you've got to set the fees and uh, consider hygiene costs uh, in the background. Uh, and and uh, that's quite a major cost uh, nowadays in the dental office. Um, as well. So you've got a base that you've got uh, to calculate for hygiene costs and, and uh, setting up uh, the system uh, and then plus the time uh, in the end uh, by five minutes. And uh, then you shouldn't forget to increase your prices every year because uh, there's something we call inflation. So $100 10 years ago had a different buying power than today. We all know this from daily shopping experience. And uh, of course, uh, we've got to consider this as well. Okay. The take home message. We've been talking about a silent killer today, periodontitis. It's underestimated. It's not known in general medicine. It's hardly known in the insurance uh, industry and it's not really known in politics. So it's our task as dentists to educate and inform our patients. It's the only way to change uh, things. Changing things means getting more health into our population. So diagnosis is imperative and should be done early and not too late. When there's swelling, pocketing, mobility, the game is over. You need a really good specialist to cope with that situation. But every dentist can diagnose periodontal disease. And even though you might uh, say, okay, periodontology is not my topic and my point of interest, you should transfer your patient to a colleague who will do this. Okay, um, data management, data assessment is important. Your treatment can only be as good as your diagnostics. So you've got to know what you're dealing with. And then therapy concepts are important. You have got to do, or you have to know what to do in certain situations, because many things will repeat, repeat themselves. Uh, and uh, it will make daily routine much easier and results much more predictable if you know what to do. So in to which 
uh, drawer to put the patient and things will then go their way with a high probability of um, success. And then we've got re instruments like airflow and sonic instruments. They are so easy to use. They are cheap. They are efficient, easy to learn and easy to use. So why should you always have problems with your shoulder by being in an uncomfortable sitting position uh, and uh, working with curettes, use machines to give you some peace of mind and peace for your body and better results. And they are gentle. We just want to remove the biofilm. We want to remove debris, but we don't want to remove soft tissue or hard tissue. This is the basic understanding. We don't want to have collateral damage in the patient because we want to do prophylaxis be alive uh, long. And using these instruments can help being more efficient and economical. All right, looking at the Rocky Mountains, I'm done. I hope uh, I could give you some ideas and uh, I would be happy if I could uh, just uh, give you some ideas to use tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. And now I'm going to go to questions and answers. Ah, okay. So, first question. Okay, first question is, do you advocate the use of uh, thermo, uh, chemotherapeutic irrigation of pockets as well as uh, supplemental mouth rinses? Uh, well, when I get this question right, uh, dear Ed, um, yes, uh, I'm a big fan of chlorhexidine as a gel uh, because I think it just stays longer in the pocket and uh, crucial is just time in, in chemical reactions and pharmaceutical reactions. And of course, uh, we recommend uh, mouth rinses, uh, depending on the case. So on a regular basis, uh, we use Meridol or Listerine, these classics, because they are well documented uh, and they show results. And uh, in acute treatment and in, in full mouth treatment, for example, in moderate or severe cases, uh, in these um, programs after periodontal therapy, uh, in these four weeks where we're going to see the patients once a, a week, uh, we're going to use chlorhexidine intensively as a rinse. And if the patient is capable uh, of installing the chlorhexidine gel in the pockets, uh, we instruct them uh, with a blunt needle and a syringe to do this uh, at home as well, in conjunction to what we do uh, in, uh, in the maintenance uh, then. Okay, uh, next one. Okay. Uh, Jalindo says, I don't think silent killer is the right word for periodontitis because uh, it's not a cancer. Yes, uh, I agree. Basically, it's, uh, it's a term I picked up from uh, the States uh, because uh, I read it and uh, I thought, yes, uh, in the English language, it's uh, much more precise uh, to point out uh, these things. And I think it's the provocation. It's a silent killer because for years or decades, the patient doesn't notice anything. And therefore, it's silent just if we're going to talk about cancer. Most of the time, if cancer develops, you won't notice it. Once you're in pain, it's too late. Even though the cancer kills directly, uh, periodontal disease will kill indirectly. Uh, and uh, what we have to understand is its impact on health, not impact on losing teeth. Uh, this is just the second point. So I hope uh, I could get this right. Okay, Nancy uh, says, can pocket depths be a risk for attachment loss or other biological complications if it's made many times? 
Hmm, okay, do I understand this question right? Nancy, do you mean um, regularly measuring the pockets? Whether this would be a, a, a risk factor for attachment uh, loss? Okay, you just say yes, okay, thank you, then I got it uh, right. Uh, I don't think so. I don't know any evidence uh, for it because the point here, once again, is knowing what to do. We've got to be gentle. So probing pressure basically is between, uh, I think, something like 30 grams. It's very gentle because especially if you've got an inflamed pocket, for example, you're going to have more pocketing if you're in the first appointment and take a measurement, let's say you're going to measure with a standardized pressure up to five millimeters. After the third appointment in this introductionary uh, recall uh, session, we're going to get the golden standard because tissue reacted, thankfully, uh, to getting rid of the biofilm. Uh, the collagen tissue, uh, the collagen structures will uh, change, will get uh, stronger again and uh, adapt to the tooth. And uh, you're going to see something uh, that you go down into your pocket and you might have three, which is a result of two effects. Uh, the decrease in the pocket. Decrease by a decrease in swelling. Uh, so this is the supra gingival pocketing and um, the second is by the change of the collagen uh, tissue uh, you won't be able to get to the bone the crestal bone uh, because this is where you usually stop when the uh, collagen tissue is uh, soft and uh, after healing you stop before and this is the bottom of your pocket. So if you've got a condition like this uh, and you're gentle, you won't uh, damage the tissue and you won't uh, find a deterioration of, this, uh, of the situation. So uh, my experience after more than 20 years of doing this regularly uh, is uh, there's no problem. Okay, I hope this helps. Okay, uh, Perla. What is your opinion about laser use in periodontology? Ah, yes. We've been de dealing with that quite uh, a long time ago. Um, we love toys in our office. It's, uh, and there are many great things out there. But not everything that the industry develops is a real benefit for the patient and, and for the office. Not in terms of money and marketing but a uh, therapeutic uh, value. So uh, when the people from the laser industry came to see us and said, oh, we'd like to place this laser in the office and you will get it even for free, uh, I looked at it and we played with it uh, and we said, well, thank you very much. Please take it home again. We don't need it. Why did we take this decision? Well, that was quite easy because they said, well, doctor, you can... Uh, take uh, the inflamed tissue out of the pocket. But one day I discovered that uh, there is no need to get rid of the inflamed uh, soft tissue in the pocket. It's um, this idea of the curettage we used to have. Uh, I think uh, it's not valuable anymore because if you get rid of the biofilm, the tissue will be nice and healthy again. Uh, and it's so thankful in its reaction. Uh, if you really do a good job in biofilm management, the reaction is so quick and uh, so good. And uh, if you take out the tissue, you will get shrinkage of the tissue. So we're going to have attachment loss and uh, because of the whole system will change. So this is why I'm not a friend of, uh, of the laser. But I've got friends who say, oh, I love it. And Carsten, you have to have a laser. Of course, a Cavo uh, laser. He's the best. But um, up to now, nobody could convince me because with the system we've got, and uh, which is proven, why should we uh, change it? Ah, uh, okay, Matthias, 
mutilating disease may be? Eh? I don't understand that question. I'm sorry. Ah. Kekting Chao, what's your opinion about periogreen, which use with diode laser activation? Ah, okay. Uh, the term uh, periogreen doesn't ring a bell, but I know what you mean. Uh, we've got different terms here in, in, uh, in Germany. It's uh, what we call PAD, photoactivated disinfection. I think this is what you're talking about. Uh, we're using that uh, for years. Very helpful because uh, if you use it in a smart manner, uh, if you apply it in a pocket, you can decrease uh, the biofilm by 99%. And uh, that's a perfect meme because it's painless, no side effects, and uh, that's just uh, perfect. Because uh, you activate uh, the chemistry by light, comes from dermatology, from uh, skin cancer therapy. And uh, it's very helpful. So if you've got it, yes, use it. Um, especially in the more severe perio uh, patients. But you can only use it if it doesn't bleed. If you've got strong bleeding, the fluid will be just washed out and then it doesn't work. So you've got to do it in the following session, for example, after regular cleaning. So, okay, Matthias again, what do you think about probiotics on perio? Ah, great question. Uh, it's coming up. Um, it's um, the research on the human uh, microbiome. Uh, and I think it's the right way. I'm not pretty, pretty sure whether um, we've got the right stuff. Uh, yet, and I'm not sure whether uh, all the substances are available in, in every uh, country. But uh, using probiotics in a concentrated way, uh, like Lactobacillus reuteri, uh, he is proven to be a we say natural um, antibiotic. Uh, that's great. You've got to take it regularly over a long period of time, but it's helpful. But uh, if you look uh, and have a chance to look at research on uh, probiotics and of uh, the microbiome, it's highly interesting. And I think there's a lot of future and, and research uh, in that. And of course, business. And there we've got to be cautious again, because we're the guys uh, who advocate it to our patients and uh, we've got to be knowledgeable about it. But we are just at the beginning and it's highly interesting. I think it's the future. And this is why I, knowing about these mechanisms of the biome, um, why I'm more reluctant with antibiotics than I was before. I was always very careful, uh, also when I performed surgery. Uh, I just use antibiotics when uh, I go uh, for augmentation, um, but um, I hardly use it in periodontal uh, treatment anymore because the side effect is uh, detrimental. It's just brutal. If it, especially if you look at metronidazole, um, it's, it's very tough with the side effects. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, Rachel, do you recommend power brushes? If so, which brand? Uh, why that brand? Okay, yes. I'm happy to answer this question. Um, there was a time many years ago when I was lecturing said, okay, electric toothbrushes is no future. There's no need because we can brush our teeth nicely with a hand brush. That's fine. But I'm involved in the development of uh, electric toothbrushes for more than 20 years now. And I had to learn and understand that the efficiency of these instruments is much better now than hand brushes. So basically from coming to the, from this poll saying not necessarily, I wondered over the years to the other poll saying 
electric toothbrushes? Yes, definitely. But then you've got to consider what? Uh, I'm uh, quite strongly involved with Philips and their research. Uh, so, of course, I personally use uh, Philips Sonicare and uh, all their uh, things. Um, and uh, I had to see my teeth, patients' teeth. Uh, they work wonderfully. Uh, the scientific research is great. Um, but you've got to learn how to handle these instruments. So what we do is we teach our patients how to use them. We say, okay, buy this product, for example, if you like to, and bring it to the office, to your recall visit, and then we're going to uh, show you how to do it. You should never have a fist grip. Always hold the instrument with your fingers because the machine will do uh, the work and then just move it over your teeth. You've got to learn this because the basic problem is collateral damage, not only in dental treatment, but also in home care. And collateral damage is the reason why Oral-B, which is the major player in the global market, and there's a lot of money involved in electric toothbrushes with an oscillating uh, motion. I think scientifically, there's no big difference between these two systems, whether you've got sonic or oscillating, but uh, there's a reason why Oral-B uh, built in this tool, this pressure control. Um, because people just tend to be too hard on their tissue. And then you see these recessions and root carriers when they're getting older, and this is something we should try to avoid. So this is quite a big challenge, actually. It's not the instrument that we have. It's knowing how to use them. I think this is the key to success. So basically, it's not as important whether you've got a hand brush or an electric brush. It's how you use these instruments. And we've got to re-educate our patients, which is uh, pretty difficult because I tend to think that uh, patients always have this autopilot uh, switched on when they start brushing their teeth in the morning or in the afternoon. So I hope this uh, will uh, answer uh, your question. It's, it's, it's a lot of, of common sense uh, in the end. Uh, we always tend to listen to uh, science to the experts and so on but basically we shouldn't forget uh, that we've got our own brain we should be critical and sometimes it's just common sense if you look at things and say okay could we do things in a different way or in a better way in a more efficient way or more gentle way then we should do it even though the majority of us might do it differently okay but time will show and results are important. They count. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. So, thank you very much for listening. It was a great pleasure of uh, spending time with you. Have fun in the future. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Stockleben, for sharing your lecture and your insightful information with us. We'd also like to thank DT Study Club for making this online course possible. And thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The C quiz is now available online on the course page, and completing it will allow you to earn your ADA SERP CE credits. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You'll receive an email notification with the link to the recording. Further questions for Dr. Stockleben may be submitted directly on the website, on the courses page, under the Ask the Expert tab. So please go ahead and submit your questions, and Dr. Stockleben will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Please be sure to visit the DT Study Club educational platform www.dtstudyclub.com and keep an eye out for a growing schedule of online courses. Thank you again to all, take care and goodbye.